I invite you to take your Bible and open with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18, as we begin our study this afternoon. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter is where we're heading. You see, friends, the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ. The written word is simply a reflection of the living word. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Therefore, in order to know the heart of God, we must read and study the Word of God. So God's Word, friends, is a reflection of His heart or who He is. It reveals to us what God is really like. And the Bible introduces God to us in many different ways, many different beautiful pictures of the Lord. It describes Him as our kind and compassionate Creator. The Bible also tells us that God is our, our merciful Maker. He is the gentle shepherd that leads us in, in green pastures and beside still waters, the one that restores our soul. He is also the door, the way of escape. He is also our high priest that ever lives to make intercession for us. He is our faithful father that watches over his earthly children. He is also our benevolent elder brother that takes care of the little ones. There are many different pictures. He is the heavenly husband and we are his earthly bride. But one of my favorite word pictures the Bible gives to us concerning God is that he is also the perfect potter, a divine potter that makes beautiful vessels out of marred and messed up clay. And this is the word picture we find in Jeremiah chapter 18. Notice what the Bible says beginning with verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1, and if you're there, and if you're ready to study this afternoon, would you please say Amen. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel he made of clay was in what condition? It was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Says the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Here's the picture of the perfect potter. The one that makes beautiful vessels of perfection from the marred and messed up clay. Now, as Jeremiah went to the potter's house, he saw the potter working the clay on the wheels and, and making and molding a vessel. It was an object lesson that God was seeking to teach Jeremiah of what, what he wants to do with humanity. And as Jeremiah looked upon the, the, the clay that was in the hands of the potters, the potter, he uses a word to describe the condition of the clay. He uses the word marred. Now that word marred is not a very pleasant word, is it? The word marred is, is, is a word that denotes brokenness. In fact, I want you to notice some of the Hebrew equivalents to the word marred. It also means disfigured or blemished. In other words, there was a noticeable imperfection. The clay was impaired in its appearance. Another word for marred, ravaged or battered. That means to beat with successive blows so as to bruise and shatter and demolish. That was the condition of the clay. Another word, wasted or injured, spoiled or rotten, destroyed or ruined, corrupt and perverted. This was the condition of the clay. It was marred. It was messed up. And this is a fit description of the lives that we have lived without God. You see, friends, the Bible makes it clear that God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils his life-giving breath. Therefore, without the breath of God, what are we? We're simply clay. We're dust. And without God, friends, 
We are marred, messed up. Our lives and our marriages and our relationships are broken. We have issues as a human race. And as, as Jeremiah looks upon this clay that's marred, this potter has every reason to, to get rid of this marred clay and start again with, with, with another in the same way. When humanity sinned and rebelled, the divine potter had every reason to just cast us off, and he could have done it. But I'm thankful that the potter does not give up. Even though the clay is marred, it's still in the hands of the potter. Amen? It says it's marred, but at least it's still in the potter's hand. Your life may be messed up, your marriage may be broken, your relationships may be, may be ruined, but but at least we're still in his hands. And as long as we put our lives in his hands, he will work it out for his own good pleasure. Can you say amen? He's going to fix us, friends. That's why the Bible says that the potter, he made it again, which shows that God is in the business of restoration, restoring that which sin has broken. And it says he made it again as it seemed good to him. Notice carefully, friends, that the clay did not dictate its own desires to the potter, but rather the potter made the clay as he willed, not our will. God's will be done. And so the potter works the clay. He presses it. He smashes it. He, he applies some pressure to form it. And then, as Jeremiah is looking upon it, God then asks the question, cannot I do with you as the potter to the clay? In other words, in that question is a plea for permission. It's a question that, 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 is, that God is pleading with us, won't you allow me to do with you as this potter is doing to the clay? And so, a question for us to consider. God does not need our help in salvation. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. We can't help God. What God needs is our permission. Can you say amen? He doesn't need your help. He needs your permission to let him work it out in our lives. And so, cannot I do with you? The answer is obvious. He can. But really, the question is, will you allow me to do for you? Will you allow me to take your marred, messed up, shattered dreams and hopes and aspirations? Will you allow me to take the broken relationships and the, the addictions and the, 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 the bad habits of your life? Won't you allow me to take those things and work it out for my good pleasure? Won't you allow me? You see, friends, when God has control of our lives, he doesn't make junk. He is a perfect potter that makes beautiful vessels out of messed up, marred, and broken clay. And so the question I want us to consider is, what will be the end product of the potter's work? What will be the end result? The Bible gives us the answer in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Would you please write it down, and you can notice with me on the screen. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye what? holy in all manner of conversation. That's the word that means lifestyle or conduct. Because as it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Here is a command, but every command of God is also a promise. And so God says that he wants us to be holy. And when we put the messed up, marred, broken clay of our lives into his hands, he makes holy vessels, vessels unto holiness. Can you say amen? Because he is a holy God. And so what he makes is holy. And then it says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, uh, sometimes we don't like this scripture, but these are the words of Christ. He said, be ye therefore, what's the word? perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Here Jesus sets the standard so high, perfection and holiness. Now friends, you don't have to get afraid of that word perfection. That word perfect simply means mature. What does it mean? That's what it means in the Greek. In other words, God wants to mature us as Christians. 
He wants to grow us. There's going to be a, a process of maturation, perfection, and, 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 it, and it's basically God taking our marred, messed up lives and restoring us back into his beautiful image of holiness. The Bible says that when God made us, he made us in his image. We were formed in his image, but because of sin, we have become deformed, but because of Christ, now he wants us to be transformed. Can you say amen? Formed to deformed to transform. And so Jesus sets the standard so high, it's a standard of perfection. In other words, the potter makes perfect vessels. He does not make junk. And then notice, in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 17, herein is our love made what? Now, what's the word perfect? What does it mean again? Mature. He wants to mature our love. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. And why? Why can we have boldness in the day of judgment? The Bible says, because as he is. Stop right there. Tell me, my brothers and sisters, how is he? Give me some other adjectives about the great God you serve. Perfect. What else? How else is he in your heart and mind? How do you view your maker? He is merciful. What else? He is kind gracious, forgiving. What else? Long-suffering, gentle, and good, awesome. The Bible says, as he is, all of those things we just mentioned, and even more, as he is, so are we. When he comes, when in this world. That's powerful, friends. Oh, friends, I don't know if the scripture speaks to you like it does to me, but the Bible here is telling us that we can be like Jesus, that God wants to put his spirit in us to cause us to walk in his ways, that we can be loving and kind and compassionate and gentle and full of faith and goodness, just like Jesus. In this world, we don't have to wait till he comes. God wants to restore to humanity his beautiful character of love. And so when we put the messed up, more broken clay of our lives into his hands and we allow him to press us and to smash us and to rip us, rip us if need be, the end product of the potter's work is going to be a vessel of holiness, a vessel fit. And friends, this is a very high standard. And by the way, do you know why the standard is so high? The reason why the standard is so high is because if the standard was low enough, some of us would think that we could reach up and attain the standard if we just jump high enough by our own good works, our own efforts, that we can somehow ascend up to the standard. But no, friends, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. And it is humanly impossible to reach that standard in and of ourselves. We can't do it, friends. We can't make it to the standard. But here's the good news. The cross of Christ is low enough. And if we can just make it to the cross, the cross is a ladder that we ascend by faith. That's what Jesus said in the book of John chapter 1, verse 51. He said that you shall see the, the, the angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. It's a reference to the, the, the vision of, of the ladder that Jacob saw in, when he was at Bethel. You remember that? He saw a ladder that touched the earth, that ascended all the way to heaven, angels ascending and descending upon it, and Jesus takes that vision and he applies it to himself. He is the ladder, friends. The cross is the ladder. And so if we can just make it to the cross, and by the way, friends, there's room at the cross for everyone. The ground is level right there. It reminds me of a story about a, a little boy. He was real young, and, and he was playing outside one day, but he wandered farther away from home than he should have. And, and, and the night was, was approaching, and it was getting dark, and this little boy ended up being lost. He could not find his way back home. And all of a sudden, a stranger saw him on the streets. And this little boy was troubled. He was afraid. He was worried. He was crying. And, and this stranger tried to comfort him and, and, and asked, little boy, what's your address? And he didn't know. He was a little boy. And which direction? And he was so disoriented. He didn't know. And he was so afraid. But then the little boy said, but, but I remember that at the end of my street, there's a church. And on the roof of that church, there's a big cross. I remember. And so if you can just bring me to that cross... I'll be able to find my way back home from there. It's the same for us, friends. We're lost. We can't find our way back home. 
But if we can just make it to the cross, we'll find our way from there. Amen? The cross is the ladder. And so don't worry about the standard, friends. When you read these words, don't try to ignore it. That part of the Bible, that's what most people do. They read these words, oh, let me just stick to the John 3, 16s and whatnot and not worry about it. But no, friends, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Amen? But don't worry about that standard. Just make it to the cross. And it's the work that God does in our lives. So we must acknowledge this is indeed what the Bible teaches. Let's not try to change the Bible to match our faulty experience. Let's allow the Bible to change our experience. You see, true Christianity is not a modification of the old, but it's a complete transformation to the new. And when we read these passages of Scripture, sometimes we get discouraged. When we compare it with our own spiritual progress, we see the standard, wow, so high, it's impossible. I will never make it. And we're tempted to give up and we think to ourselves, will I ever be worthy? Will I ever be a fit vessel for the potter? The answer to that question is no, you'll never be worthy. But here's the good news. It's not about your worthiness. Jesus is worthy. And what he wants to do, friends, is to give us his perfect righteousness as a gift. And we receive it by faith. And so the question is, how can we have such an experience like this? How can we have? We don't have any goodness, but he is good enough. And, and so it's not about our goodness. It's about his goodness. And notice what the Bible tells us God wants to do. In Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says that we don't work it out for ourselves. But notice, who is the one that does the work? It continues, for it is God which works where? In you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is the one that gives us the willingness or the desire. In other words, you can't even desire to be saved or do the right thing without the Holy Spirit working in you. So if you have a desire to do the right thing, to live for Christ and to be saved, that is evidence that it's not too late for you that God is working in your heart. Amen? The fact that you're here today shows that there's hope for every single one of us. But the same God that puts a will in our heart can also give us the power to do that which he wills. And so what is the work that God calls us to do when it says work out your own salvation? The work, friends, is simply to give God permission to work in us and for us and through us. Can you say amen? God does not need our help. He needs our permission. You know, sometimes we pray, Lord, help me to do this. Help me to be like this. Help, Friends, we need to adjust that prayer. Instead of saying, Lord, help me to be good, we need to say, Lord, give me your goodness. Give me the faith to receive that goodness. Salvation is not... You plus God's help. It's your permission and God doing the work in us. Amen? And so God works it out. Notice another one in, in Isaiah 40, excuse me, Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, thou art our potter, and we are all the work of what? Thy hands. We're all work in progress. And I don't know about you, friends, but for me, I got a long way to go. But I'm thankful that God is merciful and patient with us. Amen? We're a work in progress. And, and when you think about how the potter makes a vessel, it doesn't happen immediately. The potter has to work with that clay. It has to break it and press it and smash it and mold it. And then afterwards, he has to put it in the oven and bake it. There's a process. And sometimes that process of being molded and pressed and smashed doesn't feel good to the carnal flesh. But when we give God permission to do it, the end result is going to be a vessel of perfection. One of the most encouraging verses in the Bible to me, Philippians 1 verse 6. Let's read this together, shall we? The Bible says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. What God has started, he is more than able to finish it. You know, sometimes we start things we don't finish. Have you started a book that's not yet finished? Started it 10 years ago, it's still sitting on the bookshelf. Or maybe a project around the house, you, you started it, but it's, it's not yet finished. We start things all the time, we don't finish. But when God starts something, he is able to finish it. I love this verse in 1 Samuel 3, verse 12. When I begin, I will also make an end. Amen? God doesn't do things halfway. He goes all the way. And then the prophecy in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7, I wish we had the time to study this. 
But it tells us that one of the last works of God before he returns, it says in Revelation 10, 7, but in the days of the voice of the seven angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be what? Finished. The Bible says that just before Jesus comes the second time, the mystery of God will be finished. And you know what that mystery is? Colossians 1, verse 27, the mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In other words, the, the character of God perfected in his people as he restores us back into his image. The Bible says that it's going to be finished. But how is the question this afternoon? Well, first of all, my friends, how many of you want God to finish the work he started in your life? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Now the question is how? Today we want to discover what it takes for the work to be finished in us so that the work will be finished through us, through God's people as he give the message of the last days. And we're also going to learn this afternoon the one thing we must do in order for God to finish that work. And so there are just three points to this Bible study. How many? Actually, three subpoints, but one main point. These three subpoints support the main point. It's very simple, and I hope you'll follow me very carefully. In order for God to finish the work he started, we must remember these three things. Number one, don't ever forget, friends, that growth requires time. Growth requires time. That, per that vessel is not made perfect overnight. The potter works with it. Growth takes time. Jesus illustrated the work of redemption with a few parables I would like to share with you. The first one we want to consider is found in the book of Mark, chapter 4, verse 26 through 29. Mark 4, 26 to 29, Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and what? Grow. He himself does not know how. So here we find Jesus illustrating the work of redemption, and he's saying it's like a man casting seed on the ground. Now, what does this mean? We know very clearly that the seed represents the Word of God, the truth, or the gospel. The ground represents the hearts of humanity. So what God wants to do, He wants to cast the seed of His beautiful Word upon the ground of our hearts. And friends, when the seed of God's Word takes root in our lives, it be, the plant begins to grow. But it doesn't grow completely overnight. It grows and we know not how. In other words, this process of growth is something that we can't really uh, explain or understand fully, but we can experience it. And then notice what Jesus said. Verse 29. Verse 28 and 29. For the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head. After that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain, what is that next word? Ripens immediately he puts in the sickle because what time has come? The harvest has come. So notice, notice the language here. He says, first, then, after that, we, we find that these words imply a process that takes time. The plant is not fully mature right off the bat. It takes time. The blade, then the head, after that, the full grain in the head. And then when it's ripe, harvest will take place. What is the harvest? According to Revelation 14, 14, it's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so God is trying to, to, to grow us to be ready for that harvest. I love what it says in the book, Christ Object Lessons, commenting on this parable. Christ Object Lessons, page 65, it says this. As its growth is silent and imperceptible, but what? Continuous. So is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be what? And what's the word perfect mean? Mature. We can be perfect at every single stage of the development, whether it's the blade, the, 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 the full corn in the, the, the head, or ripened with fruit. It says that every single stage, our life may be perfect. That's mature. Yet, if God's purpose for us is fulfilled or finished, there will be what kind of advancement? Continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. 
we shall become strong to bear responsibility, and our maturity will be in proportion to our what? Our privileges. So here's, here's what it's saying, friends. Justification, that's the forgiveness of your sin, is the root of the tree. Sanctification is the fruit. Justification is the work of an instant. The moment we believe in Christ and accept into our lives, we are justified, we are forgiven, but it's not finished yet. After that, there's a, a process of growth. Uh, uh, the Bible calls it sanctification. It simply means to be set apart for holiness. But thankfully, sanctification is not the work of an instant. It's the work of an entire lifetime, friends. And how many of you are thankful for that? It's the work of a lifetime. And this sanctification, this growth will be in proportion to our, our, our privileges and our opportunities. And at each stage of growth, we may be mature at that stage. But as long as we continue to grow, there will come a time of full and final maturation. We know not how. It's not something we can really express or explain, but, but we can't experience it. And by the way, those of you who, who have plants and you, you garden and whatnot, what is something that helps the, the plant grow faster and stronger? Miracle grow. And what we need, friends, is a miracle in order to grow. Amen? Miracle grow. And so in order to help us to become ripe, with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, sometimes God sees that he must throw some miracle grow on our lives. Those stinky situations you don't feel comfortable in. Those little, uh, when, you're, when you're provoked at work by people who are unruly. The challenges and difficulties of life. It's miracle grow. Through it, God is trying to make us strong for him. Amen. And so notice, according to the time and opportunities, that will determine the level of maturity or growth. In other words, friends, if we're truly living for Christ, we ought to be growing. We ought to be able to look back 15 years ago and see where we were with Jesus 15 years ago, and then compare it to where we are today with Christ, and looking back 15 years, we ought to be able to see some growth along the way. And not just 15 years, one year ago, one month ago, one week ago, yesterday, we ought to be continually growing in the grace of God. As God gives us more time, more light, more knowledge, more opportunities, the growth must be in proportion to what he has given to us. The Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom little is given, little is required. Are you with me, yes or no? And so the point is this, friends, growth takes time. And the reason why I emphasize that, here's the reason. Because many people that I know personally who began with Jesus, they gave up a lot of things. They stopped doing all the bad things. And they were doing good for a while. But as time went on, some of these same individuals realized that they still had issues in their life. There were imperfections and, 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 and faults. And when they ended up falling into sin, they were surprised and they felt they were tempted to doubt that their whole Christian experience was fake. They didn't realize that growth takes time. I want to share with you another parable Jesus told to illustrate this. In Luke 5, verse 36, Jesus says, No one puts a piece from a, what kind of garment? New garment on an old one. Why? Why is it not good to take a piece of new garment and put it on an old it says, otherwise the new makes a tear, and also the piece that was taken out of the new does not what? Does not match with the old. In other words, here's the point of the parable. God does not add something new to your old life. Rather, God wants to replace the old with something that is completely new. That is to say, Christianity is not a modification of your, of your behavior, but true, genuine Christianity is a total transformation of the character. The old things are passed away, and all things are become new. But here's the thing, friends. Many individuals view their religious experience as a patch to cover up moral imperfections. But Jesus says this is not a wise thing to do. 
No one puts a, a piece of new garment on an old, but that's how many people view Christianity, a new garment to patch up your old life, to cover up your moral imperfections so that it will be okay with God, that you can continue to live your life how you want to live as long as you have this patch. But no, friends, Christianity is not a patch. And yet there are other people. They like the patch, and they're content to wear the old garments of self-righteousness. That's what the old garment represents, the old life and self-righteousness. So the mindset of many people is that they think to themselves, as long as I'm morally upright, I'm a good citizen, I participate in church, I give offerings, and, and I do all these good things, that's the old garments of self-righteousness, plus Jesus as a patch. But friends, the old garment and the new patch doesn't match. It doesn't match. What's going to happen is this. You see, the old must die in order for the new to live. The old life must die, friends. Paul said, I die daily. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In other words, in order for Jesus to truly live in us, the old self must die. And then I want you to notice, he uses a, a different parable in the next verse to illustrate the same point. And no one puts new wine into what? Old wineskins. So here we have a contrast. New wine, which is fresh, pure grape juice. That's what it is, friends. Into old wineskins. Why do people, why is that not a good thing to do? Or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into what? New wineskins, and both are preserved. What does this mean? Let's break it down very simply. The new wine simply represents the teachings of Christ. Remember, at the Last Supper, Jesus passed around the cup of new wine. It wasn't alcoholic. It wasn't fermented. It was fresh, pure grape juice. And he said, drink it, all of you, this is the, 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 the New Testament. Now, Christ wouldn't use old alcoholic wine to symbolize a New Testament. It would be new wine. And so this new wine, symbolizing the blood of Jesus or the teachings of Christ or the life of Christ. Why? Because the life is in the blood. Are you with me? So if that new wine was to be a symbol of the blood of Christ, it simply means it's the life of Christ because the life is in the blood. And it's the teachings of Christ. And so that's where the new wine is. So Jesus said, it doesn't make sense to put new wine into old wineskins. What does the old wineskin represent? It represents your old sinful flesh, your old way of thinking, your old way of living. The old wineskin, friends, represents our carnal sinful flesh. So God does not want us to put his perfect life in, the, in, in, in an old wineskin. Why? Because it doesn't match. What happens? What happens if we try to keep both the old life, the old wineskins, and the new wine or the new teachings or the new life of Jesus? Well, friends, here's what happens. The old life, wineskins, will waste and destroy the new wine or the new teachings. Why? Because we're going to misrepresent it to the world. The old life, the wineskin, will destroy the new wine, the teachings of Christ, by misrepresentation to the world. We're saying something, but we're living something differently. And so that's the reason why it doesn't go together. Furthermore, the new teachings will burst the old wineskins. In other words, it will make your life miserable. We can't serve God and the enemy at the same time. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. And so what God wants to do, he desires to make all things new on the inside and on the outside. Can you say amen to that? But then notice the next verse. In verse 39, Jesus adds another point to the parable. He says, and no one having drunk what? What? And what does the old wine represent? The old sinful way of life. No one having drunk old wine, what is that next word? Immediately desires the new. Why? Because he says the old is better. Don't miss the point of this parable. Jesus is describing the work of salvation in a person's life. 
And he says that the person who is accustomed to drinking old wine does not immediately desire new wine because he's persuaded, he is deceived, I should say, thinking that the old wine is better than the new. What does this mean? The person living for self and sin in this world will not immediately enjoy spiritual things. Now, does that transformation happen? Yes, but it doesn't always happen immediately. Why doesn't it happen immediately? Because this individual says and believes that the old life is better than the new. He's convinced about it. And in order for this deception of thinking that the ways of the world and sin is better than the life of Christ, that deception, it takes time for it to be broken in a person's life. Now, here's the question. Is the old really better than the new? Is the old life better than the new, new life? Absolutely not, friends. Oh, friends, old wine versus new wine? You ask, you ask a little child which they like better. You see, as adults, you know, we might say, oh, yeah, I like, I like the old stuff. I like the alcoholic stuff. But when you, when you ask a little child who hasn't experienced much life, they're going to say, oh, yeah, of course, the new one tastes way better. You see that? That's why Jesus said we must become like little children in order to be saved. Now... <laughs> The new is, of course, better. No one wants an old car, right? We all want a new car. Isn't that right? We want new, right? Let me tell you, friends, I've drunk the old, and it doesn't taste good. This was me drinking old wine, burning up my brain cells, chasing the world, partying and drinking and doing all those things. Yes, friends, I was stimulated, but I was not satisfied. Life was a never-ending routine of stimulation but no satisfaction. I've drunk of the old. I felt good for the moment, but it only left me broken. But I'm happy to tell you today, I don't drink old anymore. I've tasted of the new wine. Oh, and it's so sweet. I did not begin to live until I began to drink the new wine. What do I mean? When I began to partake of Christ. When I began to have a relationship with him. As I began to study his character and pray and, and fellowship with him, the new wine is a whole lot better. Everything that is precious to me in my life, I have received as a result of my decision for Jesus 15 years ago. I have a beautiful bride. I would never have met her if it wasn't for my decision to serve Jesus. And even if I did meet her without a decision for Jesus, she wouldn't have gone for me in the first place. I'm able to travel the whole world, friends, and share the good news with others, seeing lives changed. It's the most fulfilling life. God has opened so many opportunities. And friends, I don't have anything to boast of. The only thing I can boast of is in the mercy and grace of God over my life. I said it before, I'm just a beggar trying to share some bread. We're all in this together, friends. I'm a beggar trying to share some bread, and there's bread enough for all of us, the bread of life. Amen? But I've drunk of the new wine, and it's so sweet. It's far better than the old. And so it is possible. I'm, a living, I'm living proof. It's possible for those who love the old wine to learn to love the new wine. But the key word in the passage is that it doesn't always happen immediately. It takes time. You know why? Because our taste buds have become desensitized. And so the, to, 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 to regain that spiritual sensitivity, it requires time. What does this mean? What does this mean? Let me explain it. It takes time to regain that spiritual sensitivity. Finding joy in holiness and pleasure in spiritual things does require a consistent process day by day. Now, this is not talking about victory over temptation. God can give you victory over temptation the very moment you're tempted. He can do it. This is rather re re talking about transformation of character. And some things that we deal with fall off more rapidly than others. Everyone has different struggles in life. That's why we should not judge one another. For example, Many people who are accustomed to rap and, and, and rock music will not immediately enjoy listening to hymns. They're going to like that other stuff. They're not going to enjoy listening to hymns immediately, but it does happen. 
Many people who are accustomed to eating unclean animals will not immediately enjoy eating fruits and vegetables. Now, some people do, but not everyone. It doesn't always happen immediately. Many people who are accustomed to partying and revering will not immediately enjoy a church service like this. Many people who are accustomed to being overstimulated by watching thrilling movies will not immediately enjoy reading a book. But do those people, can those people learn to enjoy these things? Yes, the key word is immediately. The point is that growth takes time. And so if you find your heart prone to wander away from the God you love, recognize, friends, that God is still seeking to work in your life. Like I said this morning, naturally, I love sin, but I hate the fact that I love it. And God knows that, I, that, that he knows that I hate the fact that I love sin. And so we're working on it. Amen. God is working on it. So remember, friends, growth takes time. Let me read these passages, these verses very quickly. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow, friends. You can't say, oh, I accepted Christ way back in 1959, the first time you said the Lord's Prayer, and there it's done, it's finished. No, friends, no such thing as once saved, always saved in the Bible. It's a counterfeit. Biblical teaching is that we need to grow. We need to remain in a saving relationship. Notice another one. Uh, uh, we're skipping some. Let me go back. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from what? Faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so from faith to faith, implying a process of growth, our faith becoming stronger and stronger. Notice another one. Proverbs 4, verse 18. But the path of the just, that word just means righteous. The just shall live by faith. So what does it mean? The path of those who are trying to live by faith, the path of the just, is as the shining light. But how does the light shine? More and more unto the perfect day. In other words, the light should continue to shine brighter and brighter, clearer and clearer, as long as we move forward on the path. Listen, friends, a path in, it entails that there is movement. Isn't that right? A path is, is to get you from point A to point B. And as we move forward in faith, the light of the glory of God shining in and through our lives should become clearer and clearer, brighter and brighter. It's the path of sanctification. Notice another one, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are what? Oh, help me out this afternoon. Are what? Change into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the point is that as we behold, we become change, right? Birds of the same feather flock together. And why is that? Because you become who you surround yourself with. By beholding, you become change. And so if we're beholding Christ day by day, we become change into that same image. And that's, by the way, the reason why we need to be careful, little eyes, what you see, and be careful, little ears, what you hear. Amen? Because everything that comes through the avenues of our soul, the eyes and the ears, influences the mind, and it results, it transforms or changes the life. That's why the standards and the, uh, the principles of the Bible are all important. These things don't save us, but they guard the mind from us end up reflecting the things of this life. But then it says, from glory to glory, implying a process. The glory will get brighter and brighter. And then another one, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed. How often? Day by day, the outward the, uh, perishes. We get old, we get sick, and, and, and we will end up dying. The outward will perish. But as long as that inward is renewed day by day, we have the promise of eternal life. Can you say amen? And so, here's the point, friends. Just take it one day at a time. One day at a time. I love what it says in the book, The Faith I Live By, page 249. We are to live only one day at a time. We do not have to do the work of a lifetime in a few hours. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen? Oh, you ought to say amen to that. We need not look into the future with anxiety. God has made it possible for us to be overcomers. How often? Every day. So, friends, listen. Take it one day at a time. 
You may look at yourself filled with issues and, and you're marred and, and you have problems and, and you look at the standard, you're like, man, the journey is so far, I better not even start. It's, it's just impossible. Don't look at where you need to be 10 years from now. Just worry about one day, one day at a time. And friends, here's the good news. If God can keep us for a day, why not two days? If he can keep us for two days, why not a week? If a week, why not a month? If a month, why not a year? Why not a decade? But friends, don't worry about the decades and the years and the months and the weeks. One day at a time. You know that song? Day by day. That's a good song, but I like the other song better. I need thee every hour. That's even better than day by day. And then, and then, and then even better from that is the song moment by moment. Are you with me? Amen. Moment by moment, never a trial that he is not there, never a burden that he doth not bear, never a sorrow that he does not share. Moment by moment, I'm under his care. Never a heartache, never a groan, never a teardrop, never a moan, never a danger, but there on the throne, moment by moment, he thinks of his own. Never a weakness that he does not feel. Never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment, in woe or in weal, Jesus, my Savior, abides with me still. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment, I have life from above. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O Lord, I am thine. Amen. And so that's the first point. If you understand that, would you please say amen? amen? And you know what the first point helps us to be able to do? First point, growth takes time. So you know what that means? Be patient with yourself and especially with others. Amen? Be patient with yourself and especially that spouse and that child that sometimes gives you headache and heartache because we're all growing together. Are you encouraged? The second point, in order for God to finish the work, is that we must remember and never forget that the struggle is a sign that there's life. We live in a cruel and hostile world, and humanity is so fragile. We struggle, friends. Life happens, and, it, and it's a struggle, friends. God did not promise smooth sailing. He did not promise an easy, rosy road, but he did promise he would be with us to the end. We struggle. But friends, remember that the struggle is a sign that there's hope. Allow me to illustrate this. You know, there are people who love to hunt ducks. Such a beautiful creature, beautiful bird. And a serious duck hunter... He does not use a rifle like other hunters. What kind of gun does a duck hunter use? A shotgun. And the reason why is because the rifle bullet is one bullet intended for one singular target. Whereas the shotgun shell, when it's fired, it spreads, thus hitting a wider and larger target. So as the duck hunter takes aim at a flock of birds in the air and he shoots that shotgun shell, it, it, the, the, the bullet, that one bullet, hits many birds. Are you with me? And the birds fall to the ground. Now this hunter, he does not go and retrieve the birds himself. He has a companion that helps him out. What does he use? The dog. The hunting dog. And so this dog, he goes out to retrieve the kill. But something very interesting. When the dog goes to the birds, he does not go to the dead birds first. Guess which birds he goes to first? The birds that are wounded, but still alive. The birds that are struggling to get away. You see, that dog is not worried about the dead birds because they're not going anywhere. They're dead. His first goal, his first attack is to get the ones that are wounded and struggling for life. Why does he go to them first? Because for them, they still have hope. 
They have an opportunity to get away. In the same way, friends, we struggle in life. And the devil does not worry about those who are spiritually dead. They're not going anywhere. Who does the devil attack the most? You know, there, there, there was a song that came out a few years ago, Who Let the Dogs Out? <laughs> the devil let the dogs out, friends. And so these dogs, these devils, they attack those who are wounded, those who are hurting, those who still have life. He isn't worried about those out there in the world that are spiritually dead. He's got them already. He's not worried about them. He goes to the one that, are, that comes to church and is struggling against, against their own carnality. He's going to the one that is striving in prayer and seeking God with all their heart. Those are the ones, yes, they struggle. But friends, remember that the struggle is a sign that there's still life. There's hope for you. And friends, that's also a solemn warning to us because if the devil is not riding you, if he's not attacking you, maybe it's because you're dead. If you're not struggling, maybe it's because you are dead and Satan is not worried about you. You see, the devil is only, he's only angry at those who are a threat to his kingdom. That's who he attacks. And so friends, if you're struggling, remember the struggle is a son of life. Amen? Keep fighting. Keep pushing. Keep running. And don't let the struggle rob you of your hope. Let it point out to the reality that there is hope and there is life. Oh, I love what the definition of the word struggle means. The word struggle means to make forceful or violent efforts to get free of restraint. In other words, if you're not struggling to get free, it's because you are bound and you're happy being a slave. But the one that is struggling is trying to get free. It also means strive to achieve or attain something in the face of difficulty or resistance. Are you being resisted? Are you facing a difficulty? Health problems? Financial issues? Problems in your marriage? There's a struggle. It means to engage in conflict, make one's way with difficulty. Yes, there will be difficulty, but like they say, if God has brought you to it, he will bring you through it. Just keep holding on to him. Amen. I love what it says. Review and Herald, May 17, 1892. Words that were written years and decades ago, but still powerful today. He, that is Christ, will teach them that the only way to reach the heaven above is to cling to Jesus. How many want to make it to the kingdom? It requires for us to cling to Jesus. How often? Day by day, hour by hour, mounting step by step to the heights of Christ. But let no so imagine that the gaining of the eternal work, life through the finished work of Christ will involve no what? Struggle and no conflict. There will be constant battles against their own inclinations and hereditary and cultivated tendencies. That's the things that we were born with and the things we've picked up along the way, we have these tendencies to evil. Whether it be bad genes, friends, your genes is not an excuse because God wants to give us a new nature. But it requires a struggle. Then it says we are continually to be found fighting the good fight of faith. We are to behold Christ, to study his character in light of his word with fervent prayer, dwelling upon his attributes and virtues until we shall become changed into his image. There is no time to halt and rest upon the ladder of progress. The command is to go forward and upward looking to God who is above the ladder. To look back is to become dizzy, to relax your hold and to lose all to fall back into darkness. You must keep your hold on Christ, your mediator, ascending step by step, being changed from glory to glory, from character to character, as by the Spirit of the Lord. The struggle is a sign that there's life, friends. And so keep fighting the good fight of faith. It is the only fight that is worth fighting. There is a battle day by day, but friends, here's the good news. Even though there are battles, the war has already been won at the cross. Amen? 
But just because the war is won doesn't mean there's, there's not going to be a battle. The battle will continue all the way into the end of time. And so the good news is that we're in the battle, but the war is already won. So hang on to that victory and keep fighting, keep pushing. And if the devil knocks you down, just make sure he doesn't knock you out. Get back up and keep fighting the good fight of faith. And that leads us to our third and final point, friends. By the way, before I get to that, before I get to that, let me tell you this story about these individuals. There were about, as I remember the story, 250 men holding on to ropes that were attached to this blimp-like vessel. They were holding it so that the wind wouldn't, wouldn't carry it away, and, and they were holding about 250 men holding these ropes attached to this blimp, and all of a sudden, a strong gust of wind came, and the blimp like vessels started ascending into the air, and many of those brothers who were holding onto the rope, as they felt their body being lifted up, many of them let go of the rope and fell to the ground. Others let go at a very high height and experienced terrible injury. But there was one individual out of the 250, one of those brothers, who held on to that rope for 45 minutes as he's dangling in the air. 45 minutes. How many of you can do that? <laughs> I mean, that's a long time to hold on to a rope. After 45 minutes, the, the, the blimp ended up descending. And you can imagine the people flocking to make sure he was okay. The news reporters were there, and they found that he was perfectly safe. And they asked him, one of the reporters asked him, how in the world was it possible for you to hold on to that rope for 45 minutes? How did you do it? You know what he said? Oh, that was easy. I just tied the rope around me, and I, instead of holding onto the rope, I let the rope hold onto me. <laughs> and that's what we need to do, friends. You see, we don't have strength to hold on to Jesus. What we need to do is hang on to his hold on us. Because even though we have let him go and have let him down, He's not let us go, friends. Not until that door of the ark is shut will the invitation be given. So hang on to his hold on you. How do we do that practically? By his word. When you read the word and you read the promise, you say, God, I didn't say this. You said it. So I'm going to let the promise of your word hold me. That's how you hold on. You're basically letting the word hold you. You're saying, God, I don't, I don't have strength, I don't have the ability, I don't have the desire, but you said this. I didn't say it, Lord. I didn't make this promise, but you made this promise, and therefore I'm going to trust that promise. You're letting the rope hold you. Amen? Yes, there's going to be a struggle, but allow the struggle not to steal your hope. Allow the struggle to motivate you to keep fighting on. Amen? And then my last point, remember, friends, if we want God to finish the work, number one, we must remember that growth takes time. So be patient with yourself, be patient with others. Number two, remember that the struggle is a sign that there's still life and hope. And then number three, remember this, it does not matter so much how many times you fall, but how many times you rise again. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 24, please turn there with me. Oh, this is so precious. Proverbs 24. There's good news, friends. No matter how far we've gone astray, no matter how long we've been away, no matter how many times we've disappointed God, ourselves, and our loved ones, the Bible tells us this. Proverbs 24 and verse 16. Oh, you ought to memorize this. The Bible says, Proverbs 24, 16. If you're there, would you please say amen? The Bible says, for a just man falls. A what kind of man? What does that word just mean? It means righteous. But the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Therefore, this just man is not a man that is righteous in himself. It is the one that has accepted the righteous one, the only righteous one, Jesus. Here is a just man, a forgiven man. And it says that he falls. 
but it also says he falls seven times. What does the number seven represent in the Bible? Perfection. In other words, the only thing perfect this man can do is fail. He fails and falls with eloquence and perfection. <laughs> he falls, friends, seven times. But then, and rises up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. So notice, friends, this is this contrasting the wicked man and the just man. Both of them fall, but which one falls more? The just or the wicked? The just man falls more than the wicked man. Both of them fall, but the just one falls more. And friends, the reason why is because the wicked man, when he falls, he stays down in the mud of doubt, despair, and discouragement. He falls and he does not get back up. And so the just man falls more than that because every time he falls, he gets back up again. And so the point is this, it does not matter so much how many times you fall. What matters is how many times you get back up again. Can you say amen? Get up, friends, when you fall. Let God dust you off, clean you up. You move forward, you might take a few more steps and fall again, but get back up. And listen, friends, if you fall seven times and rise up again every time after that, that means how many times have you risen up? If you fall seven times and you rise up again every time, how many times have you risen back up? I hear a mixed answer. How many of you say six times? How many of you say seven times? How many of you say eight times? How many of you have nothing to say? <laughs> Friends, the correct answer is eight. Here's why. This man begins in a fallen state. We begin fallen, friends. So if we begin fallen, God picks us up. We get up once. And then... We fall seven times after that, get back up. So by the time you fall in the seventh time, you're now getting up the eighth time. You know what the number eight represents in the Bible? Number eight is a number that represents restoration. 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 God used eight people on board Noah's Ark to restore the population of the world after the flood. Restoration. Jesus was restored from the grave on the first day of the week. It's the day after the seventh. We can also say that that's the eighth day, the day where he was restored back to life. We've been in this great controversy for around 6,000 years. Jesus is soon to come. And when he comes, do you remember we studied when he comes the second time? We're going to spend the first thousand years in heaven. That's the seventh millennial rest. The seventh thousand, and then after that thousand years, the holy city descends back down to the earth. And at the beginning of the eighth millennium, God is going to restore all things as He creates a new heavens and a new earth. You may fail perfectly, but as long as you get back up, God promises to restore you back into His image. But what does it require for you to get up, friends? If you stay down, there's nothing God can do. Let him pick you back up. And here's what happens. Let me explain what happens in your heart as you get back up. What happens is, God, as you continue to get back up when you fall, God begins to put in your heart a hatred for falling. You're going to realize, man, falling isn't fun. I fall in the mud, I get dirty, I scrape my knees, I disappoint my family and myself and my God, and, and, and I don't have any peace when I fall. And God begins to put in your heart a hatred towards falling and a hatred towards that which causes you to fall, whether it be alcohol or drugs or, or worldliness or uh, you know, music, whatever. He, he begins to put in your heart, he says, this is robbing you of peace. You scrape your knees, you disappoint yourself, and as you keep getting back up, you begin to have a hatred towards sin. Not only that, but as long as you get back up, God begins to teach you to avoid the things which cause you to fall. You begin to look back and say, wow, whenever that happens, I, I end up falling. And so now he teaches you to avoid it. And, and so what happens is the frequency of your falls will become less and less and less. 
the frequency of the fall will diminish as God puts a hatred in your heart towards sin as well as the wisdom to know how to avoid temptation and the things that Satan throws at us. And so we experience victory over one part of our lives and then God moves to another part of our lives and another and it's victory unto victory, faith unto faith, glory unto glory. And as we continue to get back up, one day we're going to fall and get back up never to fall again. Now, friends, listen, the fact that we fall, we should not use that as an excuse to plan to fall. I know how human nature is. We hear this, and sometimes we comfort ourselves, oh, it's okay, I'm going to fall. No, friends, because God can keep us from falling. The Bible says in Jude 1, verse 24, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Friends, there's no reason to fall. God can keep us faithful to him. Can you say amen? But the good news is that when we do fall, we have a faithful father that will pick us back up. He's a patient and a merciful God. We also have an elder brother. They can sympathize because he has walked in our shoes. I want you to notice we're almost finished. Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. We studied that this morning. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted as well. And so the Bible tells us that we have a high priest that is able to be to sympathize with our weakness because he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And so because he's gone through the struggles that we go through in life and he's overcome by faith in his Father, he teaches us how to win that same victory as well. So we have an elder brother. And so listen, if you fall, fall on Jesus. Fall on Jesus. Fall on that rock and let it break the carnality of your life. Remember Jesus said, some people the rock is going to fall on them, but others will fall on the rock. Friend, we fall, fall on the mercy of God. And let that love catch you. Let that love break up the hardness of your life. We have an elder brother that picks us up when we fall. Now, I never, this, th these verses meant even more to me when I became an elder brother. You see, for 16 years, I was the only child, all by myself. You know, sometimes I always coveted, you know, the, my classmates in school who had older brothers. And, you know, whenever, you know, whenever, uh, you know, someone was picking on, uh, you know, a, a weaker child, that child sometimes, in order to deal with the bully, he would say, you better not mess with me, I'm going to call my older brother. But I didn't have an older brother. I couldn't do that. And so I never really understood how special it is until... When I was 19, mom and dad got together, and baby brother comes upon the scene. Overwhelming surprise. And I was just so happy. I wanted to give him the best opportunities that I could give. Teach him everything I know. Take him out to experience new things that he never experienced before, and, and to protect him from from the things that I fell into. I wanted to do all I, I could. That's just the nature of an older brother. Jesus is our older brother, friends. You know, growing up, I grew up riding dirt bikes and even racing. This is me when I was 13 years old, flying high in the sky. I was doing races. I raced for 10 years up at Kahuku. I was first place in my class. Very good at it. My dad started me when I was three years old on a little quad, and then as I continued to grow, I, he put me on a bike with two wheels, and then, and then and the, the, a larger engine, larger, larger. And, and, and you see, friends, you know, some people grow up playing basketball, others playing football, others doing golf. We grew up riding dirt bikes. It's, it's wonderful. I love it. Go out in nature, good exercise. You're sweating, breathing fresh air in nature with God. And, and so we, we grew up doing these things. And this is the way in which my dad and I connected together. And so uh, since I did it all my life, when my baby brother was born, we were excited to get him into it as well. That was me when I was three. My mom. And so, but here's the point. 
I wasn't able to fly these jumps right, up, right in the beginning. It took some time for me to build up the confidence and the skills and the ability to do well on a dirt bike track. And I had to go through many crashes in order to get to that point. And I experienced some terrible crashes, but if, if I would have just given up when I crashed, I would not have been able to, to be where I am today in this particular hobby. It's the same thing with the Christian life. Get back up. So as I was mentioning, when baby brother came upon the scene, we were excited. Little Micah boy. And I'll never forget the day that I was teaching him how to ride a bicycle. Before he could ride one with, with, a, with a motor, he had to ride one with, you know, by himself. So we were at the beach there in Yokohama's and, and on, the, on the grass where it was nice, he had his knee pads and his elbow pads and his helmet and, and I was behind him pushing him on the bike and teaching him, you know, trying to teach him how to, how to, how to balance and how to steer and how to brake and how to go. And as long as he was in my hand, what is that? he wouldn't fall. Okay. But the moment I let him go, he would go for a few strides, but then he would have to put his foot down. It, didn't, it wasn't overnight that he learned how to balance on a bicycle, but as long as he continued to try, even though he was afraid, as long as he continued to do it, eventually he learned how to ride the bicycle. And so finally, we can now put him on one that has a motor with gasoline that can go fast. And I'll never forget the first day trying to teach him. He crashed, but he did good. In fact, that first day that he crashed, he, he didn't want to, he, didn't, he was done for the day. He crashed and he was done. But as time went on, he found more confidence to give it another shot. And so uh, here we were in the trails and I was behind him and I was leading him from the back. He was in front of me. I had the camera on my helmet and he was doing good. I was so proud of him. He was looking back for direction. Which way do I go? Make sure he's on the right track. The elder brother. And so he went. I was so proud of him. He's doing good, way better than before. And as I, I, I approach in this particular incident, guess what happened next? He fell. He was on the ground. And he was afraid. He was hurt. Listen. You alright, buddy? Oh, man, you alright? Here, give me a hand. It's okay, it's okay, man. There. As an older brother, what did I do? Hey. Tried to calm him down. Give me your hand. Took the bike off. Oh, man, I'm sorry, buddy. Lifted him up. You're slippery over here, huh? Let him know that it's okay. Falling is a part of the experience. You did good on that last But you just have to keep trying. That's what Jesus does, friends. He picks us up. He's our elder brother. And he gives us the encouragement to keep on trying, amen, to keep on going. Now, I had permission to share that video clip for my little brother. But he said, I can only share that video clip as long as I show this one. <laughs> and so a few years later, here he is, and he's even on a bigger bike than this one. And because he kept getting back up, here's what he can do today. How many, you, how many of you would say that's growth? Is that a big improvement? But if he never got back up, if he allowed his fears to get the best of him, there's no way he would do this. Get back up, friends. Get back up. We have an elder brother that picks us up. My heart is sad not being able to be here in Hawaii all the time. My wife and I, we live in California. That's where God has planted us for the time. We're praying that hopefully we can get back here. And sometimes I feel guilty not being here for my little brother, only able to come and visit every so often. But when I do, I, I try my best to take him out of the house and go and experience life. 
And I remember one day coming home, I took him to the mountains in Mokaleia. We're climbing the mountains together, just brother time, having a good time in nature. And as we're coming off the mountain, my little brother, he, he, he slipped and he fell. And he hurt his toe, his nail was broken and it was bleeding and he was in pain and he was afraid and he didn't know what to do and we're high on the mountain and he didn't have the courage or the ability to get off the mountain. So as an older brother, what do you think I did? I said, get on my back, I'll carry you. I carried him to safety. That's what Jesus does for us, friends. When you feel like you can't take another step, when you're wounded and hurt, just let God carry you. He has promised to us, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands shall they bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. God will carry us through. And then I love this verse in Isaiah 63 and verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. God carries us. When you look back at your life, and you see only one set of footprints, it's not because he left you. He was there, friends. He's the one that carried you through that experience. And if he is strong enough to carry the weight of the world on his shoulders as he bore the sins of humanity at the cross, if he was strong enough to do that, surely he can carry you in all your problems and difficulties. Let him carry you to the safe haven above. Are you encouraged this afternoon? If we want God to finish the work he has started, if we want the potter to make us a vessel of holiness and perfection, what three things must we remember? Number one, we must remember that growth takes time. So be patient with yourself and be patient with others. Number two, remember that the struggle is a sign that there is still life and hope. So allow the struggle to motivate you to push on and to fight on. And then number three, remember that it does not matter so much how many times you fall, but how many times you Rise again. The book of Micah says, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. And now this quotation from the book Steps to Christ, page 64. Let me ask you, we're closing with this. Let me ask you, if you can relate with these statements, I want you to raise your hand and say amen. There are those who have known the pardoning love of Christ. Have you known that? Amen and who really desire to be children of God. Is that you? Amen. Yet they realize that their character is imperfect. You better raise your hand. <laughs> and their life faulty. You better raise two hands. And they are ready to doubt whether their hearts have been renewed by the Holy Spirit. To such I would say, do not draw back in despair. Why? Because we shall often have to bow down and weep at the feet of Jesus because of our shortcomings and mistakes. But we are not to be discouraged, even if we are overcome by the enemy. We are not cast off, not forsaken and rejected of God. No! Christ is at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. He desires to restore you to himself to see his own purity and holiness reflected in you. And if you will but what? Yield yourself to him. You don't have to help him. You just got to yield. You have to give him permission to work it out. And if you will do this, he that hath begun a good work in you will carry it forward to the day of Jesus Christ. Pray more fervently, believe more fully, and as we come to distrust our own power, let us trust to the power of our Redeemer. Because the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. The closer you come to Jesus, the more sinful you see yourself. Why? Because your vision will be clearer. Your imperfections will be seen in broad, distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence. It is what? 
It's evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power and that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. The point is this, friends. Yes, we fall, and we will often have to bow down and weep and cry at the feet of Jesus. We disappoint Him in ourselves and our loved ones, and we can come to Him, and He is a merciful God. He not only died for us, but He ever lives to make intercession for us. And it tells us that the closer we come to Him, the more sinful and faulty we will see ourselves. Why? Because we will see what holiness is really like like. It's just like a mirror, friends. If there's a mirror on the back wall from this distance, I look at myself in the mirror and man, I look pretty good. I have my nice suit and these lays and I'm preaching the word. I look so good from this distance. But the closer I come to that mirror, I begin to see the blemishes on my face. I begin to see the defects of my life. It's the same with, with the Christian experience. The closer you're brought to Jesus, the more unworthy and unrighteous and sinful you will see yourself. And so remember, friends, that's evidence that Jesus is drawing you closer to himself. So be not discouraged. Praise God that you're, you're, he is helping you to understand what holiness and righteousness and salvation is all about. And that's also a very strong warning because, friends, listen, if we think we're pretty good, that shows just how far away we are from him we're blinded by our own self-righteousness and so if you see yourself sinful unworthy unholy praise God that God is drawing you to his side you keep beholding and he will change your life amen my last verse then we close please turn with me to Hebrews Chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we are in a race. And we're almost finished. Some of you have been in this race all your life. You're running a marathon. Others of you, those who got baptized six months ago, you, you just begun. You are, you are in a sprint to the finish. But no matter where we are, we're not competing against each other as long as we finish. And how can we finish? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And how can we finish it? Verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. And what do we see when we look at him? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He begun it and he will finish it. And then it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, if we want to finish the race, we just, we just have to keep our eyes on Jesus. And by beholding, we will become changed. By beholding him enduring Gethsemane and Calvary, even though he felt like giving up when he prayed, if it's possible, let the cup pass from me. In the moment Jesus felt like throwing in the towel, tapping out and going back to heaven, we see that he had a faith that endured Gethsemane, that endured the darkness of the cross, and he went all the way to the finish line. And because of that, he is now at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven, the place that we want to be. So as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, study his victory and his faith, God will then finish the work he's begun in us. And so here's the principle I leave you with. It's called the gaze glance principle. The what principle? If you want to be successful and victorious, if you want to be saved, you must remember the gaze glance principle. And what is that? We need to gaze on Jesus. Look full into his wonderful face. Behold him, study his character, think about him, surround yourself with spiritual people, gaze upon Jesus, and as you behold, you become changed. Gaze on him, but then glance at yourself in self-examination to take inventory of your life. The Bible says we need to examine ourselves and search our hearts, right? Because we can be like Peter saying, Lord, I'm ready to die for you. Everyone else is going to forsake you, but not me. I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm all the way. And before the night was finished, he's denying Christ three times. The worst deception, self-deception. That's why we, need, we don't even know our own hearts. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Only God. That's why we glance at ourselves and examine to see how we're doing, but then we quickly put our eyes back on Jesus and gaze upon him. But what most people do, instead of gazing on Christ and glancing at ourselves, we gaze upon ourselves and we glance at Christ. 
once a week in church. And no wonder why we are spiritually defeated. No wonder why our joy has been taken away because our eyes are on ourself. And so somebody said, when you look at yourself, you don't see how you can be saved. But when you look at Jesus, you don't see how you can be lost. When you look at yourself, you don't see how you can be saved. But when you look at Jesus, you don't see how you can be lost because he's made a way for us, friends. So my encourage you, encouragement to you, church family, my beloved brothers and sisters, after today, I don't know when I'll be back into this church. Good possibility, never. If I never see you again, if you never see me again, meet you in the kingdom. Keep your eyes on Christ. Not yourself, not church members, not the world. Jesus alone. And as we do, the potter will finish the work in us. And so our prayer, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, master today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see Christ only, always living in me. That's my prayer. Is it yours? If you want God to finish the work in your life, I want to invite you to stand with me as we close. Actually, let's, not, let's go to our knees, shall we? Let's reverently kneel before the Almighty King and let's allow Him to make us a beautiful vessel of holiness reflecting His image. Let us pray. O oh Lord, have Thine own way. We thank you, dear God, that you are a merciful and patient potter. Lord, I know that I myself, as well as my brothers and sisters here, we have caused you trouble. We have brought you pain. But thank you, dear God, that even though our lives are marred, we're still in the potter's hand. And we thank you, divine potter, that you're not done with us yet. So we pray that you'll take us into your hands. That you'd mold us and make us. Lord, if we need to be torn down and broken and start from the beginning again, Lord, let it be, Lord. We put our lives in your hands today. We realize that Jesus is soon to come. We want to be ready, dear God. So please, have thine own way. Help us to never forget that growth takes time. Give us the patience with ourselves and others that you have for us. Help us never to forget that the struggle is a sign that there's still life and hope. So help us, Lord. May the struggle enable us and encourage us and motivate us to continue fighting and help us to never forget that it doesn't matter how many times we fall but how many times we rise again so bless us Lord and we thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus name we pray that all of God's children say Amen Amen, Amen.